The next thing we want to do today is we want to uh, start to go through the different checks that the president has over the other branches. So we want to find the checks that the president has over the legislative and over the judicial branch, things that the president uh, can use to limit the power of those branches. The first that we're going to look at, we're going to look at checks that president has over the legislative branch. All right, so the first one that you probably think of, the most obvious check that the president has over the legislative branch is the power of the veto. The veto is the president's most effective check over the legislative branch. The veto allows the president to reject a bill that Congress has passed. So even if it passes both the House and the Senate, the president can veto this bill. So, <clears throat> but we say that the veto is the most effective check because even if a president says that he's going to veto the bill, that's usually enough to make the members of Congress consider what the president thinks. Uh, we mentioned how Congress controls the budget, but the president has the opportunity to veto the budget. So if the president announces that they're planning to veto a spending bill because it includes things that he doesn't like, this is how the president makes sure that Congress creates a budget that is reasonable for them. Congress is rarely going to have enough votes to override the president's veto. It takes two-thirds of all uh, congressmen to override a president's veto. And one party is not, ever, uh, is not usually going to have a majority uh, that large. So the veto <clears throat> is really rare that enough congressmen come together to override the president's veto. Less than 4% of all presidential vetoes have ever been overridden. The time when a veto is likely to be overridden by Congress is when a Congress is passing a law that limits a presidential power. So usually Congress can come together in their own version of separate, like their, their own place in separation of powers. They want to make sure that they are as powerful as the president. So they limit the president's power. The president vetoes that bill and the Democrats and Republicans in Congress are willing to come together to override that veto. Another check the president has over the legislative branch is just the vice president. The fact that the vice president is the president of the Senate gives the president some form of a check over the Senate. The vice president has powers uh, to be presiding officer of the Senate if they chose to be. The vice president has the tie-breaking power in the Senate, and they, the vice president will almost always vote according to the president's wishes. So this is a form of giving the president the critical vote in lawmaking in the Senate. So the vice president is a very important check that the president has over the legislative branch, particularly in the Senate. The president's salary is a check that the president has over Congress. We mentioned uh, yesterday <clears throat> that the president's salary cannot be changed while they are in office. So the president cannot be uh, given raises or pay cuts. And that actually is a check because that means that Congress has no way to influence the president's decision making. If they were able to give the president pay raises and pay cuts, then Congress could threaten to cut the president's pay if the president <laughs> were not if the president were not going to approve a law that Congress wanted passed, or they could uh, encourage the president to uh, approve all their laws by promising the president a pay raise. So the fact that the president's salary cannot be changed is an important check that the president has over the legislative branch. Another important check that the president has over the legislative branch is the fact that the president is commander in chief. We mentioned with Congress's powers that Congress has the power to declare war and raise the army and regulate the army and all that, but it's the president who runs the military. The president has the war-making powers and makes the decisions about how the military will be used. Presidents are able to use the military without an official declaration of war from Congress. This has gone all the way back to Thomas Jefferson. This has always been a normal thing that presidents do. They don't necessarily wait for Congress to declare war, but they go ahead and send the military into a place of combat that they might need to use it already. Um, the president could also, if Congress were to declare war, the president could just refuse to use the military since the president is in charge. So that's a way that, that the president could limit Congress's power to declare war. Um, another important check, it's less important now than it used to be, but we call these recess appointments. The president needs to fill offices all over the government, and it requires Senate approval. And so uh, the president is able to make what we call recess appointments. And these people are not the official, like, 
secretary of state or something like that, but they're the acting secretary of state. So the president fills these offices without Senate approval if the Senate is not in session. But this is, this is a lot less common than it used to be. Other important checks the president has over Congress is the ability to call Congress into session or to adjourn Congress. We mentioned that the president has the power to call Congress in for a special session. This is typically in times of emergency when there's like a real uh, pressing need for policy. The president is able to call Congress in for a special session. Uh, for example, President Roosevelt called a special session of Congress the day after Pearl Harbor so that he could get Congress in there to issue a declaration of war against Japan. If there's something like a, like an economic crisis or some other type of crisis, the president can call Congress into session and make sure that Congress gets in and works on that thing that the president needs. Uh, the president also has the power to adjourn Congress if the House and Senate don't agree on when to adjourn. This is a power that the, no president has ever used, so we don't really know the impact uh, of this power uh, and how it could be used as a check, but it is in the Constitution. But the more important power uh, would be president's ability to call Congress into session. So basically, this gives the president an opportunity to control what Congress does. Basically, the president has a power to say, get here and do this as quickly as you possibly can. Get here and solve this problem. And the president also has an ability to say, if you won't solve this problem, go home. Uh, that's the power of the president that has never been used. Um, but now, uh, since we have, since it's easy for congressmen to travel across the country, the president's ability to call special sessions of Congress is also a lot less important than it has been in the past. So these are both still checks that the president has, but not necessarily the most important check. Now we want to shift over and look at the checks that the president has on the judiciary the checks that the president has on the judicial branch. What we see in the picture here, president exercising one of their checks. This is President Trump nominating uh, Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. So the most obvious check that the president has on the judicial branch. The main check that the president has over the judicial branch is that the president gets to appoint all federal judges. So this uh, starts at the Supreme Court. Those are our most high profile judges, but goes all the way down to district level federal judges. All of these appointments are lifetime appointments. The president's ability to choose judges is one of the main ways that the president can ensure that their ideology remains a part of the government for a very long time. All federal judge appointments have to be approved by the Senate, and that's at all levels. Um, but the Senate has found ways to usually speed past and almost automatically approve presidential appointments to those lower federal courts. The, the Supreme Court appointments are still very high profile, get a lot of media attention and scrutiny from the members of the Senate. But this is the president's most important power when it comes to controlling the judicial branch. The president also has pardon powers. This is an important check for the president to exercise after the judicial branch has uh, ruled on cases um, and, and president can impact the effect of those. So we've gone through these already. Uh, the president ha can, has the ability to pardon anyone for a federal crime. Pardon means that you're going to completely forgive from punishment. So a person who's been convicted of a federal crime, the president can pardon them. And uh, not only are they not punished, but this is basically wiped from their record. It is as if the, uh, the crime and punishment never occurred. The president also has the ability to grant amnesty. Now, amnesty is like one pardon that applies to a whole group of lawbreakers. So a president is able to grant amnesty, like we would call this a blanket pardon. It just applies to everyone who violated uh, the same law. Very famously, the president, um, after the Vietnam War, so many uh, people had avoided the military draft during the Vietnam War, and that is punishable by law. So these people were facing uh, jail time and stuff, um, and the president granted amnesty to all what were called draft dodgers at the time. And so anyone who had broken that law was now free to uh, not have to worry about uh, facing punishment for that crime. And then there's commutation. The president uh, can shorten a person's sentence. This is something that's been used a lot by President Obama and President Trump. That's actually what's going on in the picture back there. President Trump hanging out with his friend Kim Kardashian uh, as they work on some commutations of people's sentences. Now, commutation means that the president can shorten a person's sentence, and this is a lot less controversial. So what Obama and Trump have both done is they have shortened a lot of sentences of nonviolent uh, drug offenders. So uh, people that were in, in jail for uh, long periods of time 
for drug trafficking but had otherwise clean records. Both Obama and Trump have shortened those sentences. Some laws <laughs> have mandatory sentences that can be you know, somewhere like 20 years long. And the president can take a person who's been in jail for three years and say, I'm going to shorten your sentence from 20 years to three years. And that person is freed. So they, their punishment is over. The difference between the pardon and the commutation is that the person who receives the commutation still has this conviction on their record. They have completed their punishment instead of their punishment has gone away and never happened. But the pardon powers that the president has, these are very important and allow the president to, uh, to limit the judiciary's ability to punish people for crimes. The last check here would be kind of a, an unofficial, uh, this would be an informal check at least, it's not necessarily in the words of the Constitution. Uh, the Supreme Court, all federal courts rely on the executive branch to put, the pre to put their decisions into action. And so it's up to the president to implement those decisions or to carry out those decisions. The president is responsible for translating the decision of the court into an actual government action. If the president ignores the court's ruling, then the court's ruling doesn't really matter. It doesn't really have any effect. You guys, you guys probably know examples of these from U.S. history class. Very famously, the Supreme Court ordered President Andrew Jackson to uh, stop forcing Native Americans off of their land in Georgia in the early 1800s. And the quote from Andrew Jackson at the time was, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. Meaning that Andrew Jackson was going to keep doing exactly what he wanted to do, and it didn't matter what the Supreme Court said because the Supreme Court has no enforcement power. The Supreme Court relies on the president and the executive branch to enforce those policies, and if the president refuses to enforce those policies, then the court decision doesn't really matter. In fact, it was not until Harry Truman, this is in the 1940s, Harry Truman was the first president to ever listen to the Supreme Court when they limited the president's actions. All presidents, when limited by the Supreme Court, not just Andrew Jackson, but even including Lincoln and other presidents in our, in our, early, in our 1800s and early 1900s, if they were limited by the Supreme Court, they just ignored the decision. And so that, made, uh, that, that was a version of a check on the Supreme Court's power. All right, so what we've looked at so far are checks that the president has on the other branches. So the ways that the president can limit the legislative branch and the ways that the president can limit the judicial branch. What we're going to move on to now is we're going to look at the ways that those branches can limit the president.